get this thing going here. And we're going to start right off with Acts chapter 10. Chapter 10. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius. And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa, and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon of Tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. On the morrow, as they went on their journey, and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry, and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance, and saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet, knit at the four corners, and let down to the earth wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Now while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house, and stood before the gate, and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, were lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius, and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into his house, and to hear words of thee. Then called he them in, and lodged them. And on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea. And Cornelius waited for them, and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, and fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself also am a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company, or come unto one of another nation. But God has shewed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without gainsaying, as soon as I was sent for. I ask therefore, for what intent ye have sent for me? And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call hither Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, are we all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. 
That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism was John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and shewed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. All right, there we go. This is, uh, this chapter 10 is what I call, you know, boom bang chapter. And the reason why I call it boom bang, because it's going to take a lot of things that people hold in uh, and, and self-confidence, people's ideals, and this chapter by the Holy Ghost just blows them up. And it's important to recognize this because if you don't allow this to be part of your relationship with Jesus Christ, you will become a static Christian. A static Christian is someone that learns something once and then never moves, never grows. It's not good. You ever watch a, a, a plant that starts off as a seed? And then the minute that it gets to the point where it's about to germinate, the seed kind of cracks open and a little sprout comes out, right? Now, if you look at that and you say, okay, I've taken something with non-living life. The seed just it has potential for life, but it, it's not live. But then all of a sudden it becomes alive and the sprout comes up. And you stay a sprout your whole life. Guess what? You have not fulfilled your true destiny as a seed. You, you, would, you are not a sprout seed. Now, you're supposed to grow to become a whatever you're supposed to be. Maple tree, oak tree, tomato plant. You know, whatever it is you're supposed to be. That's what you're supposed to. But if you stop and say, I was a seed that was not taking in any oxygen, was not taking in any nutrients from the soil, was not taking and transform any chemicals from the water. I was just a seed, but then I became alive and I began to what? Sprout. Now, why am I using this analogy? Because that's what happens to us when we are born again. We are what? In sin. Dead. We're dead in sin. All right? But then when we receive the Lord, guess what happens to us? We become what? New. We become new, but we also become what? What's another word? Alive. 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 Alright? So we become alive. Now, once you become alive, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to start growing. But don't get so excited and get so locked in to the first growth. That's not the end of it. You got more growing to do. And this, right, this chapter here shows a lot of things. Remember, when Jesus was even preaching, he told his disciples, I want you to go first to where? Jerusalem. Then, then when you go to Jerusalem, you're going to have some success. Did you stop there? No. What are you supposed to do after that? Go to Samaria and the part of the Exactly. Exactly. You're supposed to go on from another province and then another province until you cover the what? The whole cover the whole globe. All right. Keep that in mind as we review this. It's very important that we recognize this. Um, and we're going to see a couple other things. But let's start off. Let's look at this. At first, it starts off by saying there was a certain man, a centurion, called Cornelius, a centurion. I said there was a certain man of Caesarea, I should say, called Cornelius, a centurion of the band of the Italian band. All right. So now, 
we started off. Who talked to the Ethiopian eunuch? Remember that? Yeah. That was Philip. <clears throat> right? Now we have another uh, nationality, the Italian uh, band, which is really coming directly from what area? I mean, who, who's ruling this area right now? Rome. 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 Right. But you think of that in Rome, right? But where, what national, what nation, or I should say, what people are actually now leading the new and, and uh, baby church? Jews. Jews. All right. Keep all that in mind. Right. So you got people that, that are of different nationalities that are starting to do what? Interact. But why are they interacting? Because of the what? Philip talked to the Ethiopian unit because he wanted to, he saw him what? Reading the scripture. And the spirit gave him wisdom to go and do what? Enlighten him. All right? The true mixer here, the true, the true uh, thing that is actually mixing everything together is the Holy Spirit. I wonder if you pick that up, you see this. Because look what happens. Look at verse 2. Uh, this, this, what kind of man? What kind of man was uh, um, Cornelius? Verse 2 tells us, A devout man, one that feared God and all his house, which gave much alms to the church and prayed to God always. Alms to the people. What does your Bible say? Much alms to the people. And prayed to the Wait, 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 wait. Let me read this again. What Cornelius, let me start it again. Let me make sure we're not confused here. All right. I'm going to read this again. It says that Cornelius, talking in the second verse. Y'all in the second verse, right? Yes. All right. A devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the church. No, the people. We got people. We got people, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But see, a church isn't a building. A church is people. That's what I just want to say. You know what I'm saying? You're right, but I'm talking. I'm talking for. That translation he's got there is probably just saying the people of the church. No, I'm, I'm misreading it on purpose. Okay. I'm doing that on purpose because I'm trying to make the he's point. Trying to make a point. I know what he's doing. Right. Yeah. Oh. Because the reality of it is, the reality of it is. That if we don't recognize people as the church, church we'll get sucked in to give into organizations, not having any true connection to the needs of our community, because all we figure we can do is write a check to blah 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 organization and we're covered. Now, with me saying that, I'm not saying that all help and charitable and nonprofit organizations are bad and that we should not contribute. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is to don't let that replace your hunger and desire to want to help people face to face. Make That's your main focal point. Exactly. And what happens is a lot of times people say, well, because I gave to so and so organization, I can feel good about what I did and I don't have to deal with people and, and try to help nobody or pray for other people because I've already done my stuff. Like people say, I gave it the, I gave it the office. I gave it the office. We just had that that charitable giving thing. We just you know, mm -hmm. we just had that out where you you know you felt the stuff. How much right. of your you your job do you want to give to charitable organizations? And people you know put a certain amount in. And when they people come around asking for, oh, I give for, I give you know out of my job. My job has that, and I give that way. And that's how they they clear their mind. It's not good. All right, we should not uh, think like that. Um, we should be willing to deal with people directly. But let's keep on. Uh, we, I, I just think we point that out because one of the things about Cornelius was that this is what he did. All right? And it says, and he prayed to God always. How should we pray? We, sh we should pray what? Always. Pray without ceasing. Okay? It says, uh, and he saw a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto Cornelius. Now, what did this angel say unto Cornelius? It says, and when he had looked upon him, and he was afraid, he said, uh, what is it, Lord? And he said unto, unto him, thy prayers and thy alms, or thy, or your, what is that, what is alms? Make sure we understand that. Everybody know what that is? Your donations, your gifts, your charitable works. 
are come up for a memorial before God. Did you see this? Cornelius' care for the, his community, for the people around him, and his love for God and his constant communication with God came up as a memorial to God. All right. All right. So now we kind of understand who Cornelius is. Let's keep moving. Verse 5. Now send a man to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. Wait a minute. I must be reading this thing wrong again. Let's see something here. All right. Wait a minute. Peter, the apostle Peter, says in verse 6 that he is lodging. What does the word lodging mean? Staying. He's staying with? He's staying with at the house of Simon the who? The tanner. The tanner? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Does the scripture say, do you remember even from the uh, story of Samson, certain things that Samson was not supposed to do? He, he intensified one of the laws of Moses and his commitment to, to the Lord from a baby. He was not supposed to have a razor to touch his head, and he also was not supposed to do what? Touch a what? Dead a dead carcass. He was not supposed to touch anything that was done. Remember, in Samson, he, he disobeyed that because he found honey inside a carcass of what? A lion. Right? And that's where, you know, one of the things that he did to help break all of his, his, uh, his commitments as, a, as a, a, a young man when God gave that to him. Well, anyway, <clears throat> that is taken directly from the Mosaic law that, w that you are unclean if you have to touch a dead carcass. It makes you unclean, no matter what it is. You keep, you're unclean. Now, wait a minute. What's a tanner? A tanner is a person that deals with what? Mm -hmm. they, 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 leather. Leather, leather comes from what? Dead animals. Dead animals. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. That's your job. That's what you do all day, every day? Mm -hmm. How long are you unclean? All day. All the time. All the time. <laughs> so a tanner was a person that the, the community recognized you know, we kind of need you. But ain't nobody going to socialize with you because you unclean all the time. And so they were outcast to a certain degree. They, they were not uh, uh, put to death for being unclean. They were not uh, cru uh, crucified, but they weren't socialized with. Nobody. And if you were a, 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 a woman and you married and you were a spouse to marry somebody and they didn't tell you that they were a tanner. You could have that, uh, that uh, engagement annulled just on that statement when they found out that you were a tanner. It's almost like he was staying at a leper colony almost. You might as well <laughs> be. Leprosy, right? it, that's how they treated you, the wow. tanner. But now wait a second now. Wait a second. All right, see, now I'm getting a little. Why is Peter hanging with the tanner? Y'all remember, just go back last chapter. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. All right. What did God tell him to do? Y'all remember that? Verse 9. Let's go back to verse 9. Go to verse 40. But Peter uh, put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed. And turning, actually I'm going further up. But we see what Peter, he, he's praying for Tabitha. But let's go back to 42. And it was known throughout all of Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. This was during the time when Peter raised up Tabitha. All right? Verse 43. And it came to pass that he tarried many days in Joppa with one Simon, a what? Tanner. All right? And he's been with this, with this man for a while. But the Lord had instructed him to go down to that area. To First of all, he had to do what? He had to raise up Dorcas, who was also called Tabitha, the person that, that made what kind of, uh, uh, she made garments. And she was so well appreciated in the community because she was doing what? Because she was sewing clothes. 
Now, I'm pausing there because I want that to sink in. This woman was highly anointed by God for service in the community because she made clothes for people. You see how drifted we can get? Little simple things. Here she is, the, the community falling apart, mourning and crying, and God is so amazed, God instructs Peter to go down there, raise this woman from the dead. They still need her in that area. What was her gift? Oh, she was a mighty preacher. No, she made clothes. Oh, no, 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 no. She was a, she was a powerful evangelist. No. But what kind of what kind of work did she do? Simple, meeting the needs of people. All right. Well, let's go back to chapter ten now. So Peter's staying still with Simon the Tanner, and what does what is the Tanner doing? He's making goods for folk. See, the mindset of a person that would decide to become a Tanner is a person that would say, "I understand." ceremonially, I'm going to be what? Unclean. Because I'm sure at the end of the day, he went and washed and cleaned himself and da-da-da. But ceremonially, he was still what? Unclean. Unclean. And he understood that, but he understood also, i got to make a living, and I'm giving something to people. So you got to have the mindset to say, I really don't care how people really see me as long as I know I'm doing good for people. You see, what's in the, you see what the scripture is telling us here? It's clear to me that a lot of times we put emphasis on the wrong thing. Little simple things that we can do. All right, let's get back. Verse 7. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants, so he called two of his, uh, his servants, and, uh, and devout uh, soldiers, uh, which waited on him continuously. So now he went and got two of his... Uh, his helpers, two, two people that work for him. Right? Verse 8, and when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. All right? Verse 9, now on the morrow, or on tomorrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went down, went up onto the housetop. Now, keep in mind, back in those days, the housetop was kind of like... Like, like, yeah, it was like your lawn. They didn't have lawns and manicured places where they could go out and lay out and get the sun, but they had flat roofs. And they would go up on the roof, and that was how they would, like, go outside. The kids would go out there to go up on the roof to play and da da da. So that was kind of like the place you would hang out at. That was, you know, go outside, well, they would go to the roof, more than likely. All right? So that's where Peter went. He went up to the roof, rooftop, uh, to pray. And it was about the sixth hour. Well, we know the six hour probably would be, you know, when we're dealing with our time, that would be what? 12 noon. Because the day starts at what time for them? Six. six. So six hours later is what? Noon. Noon. So it's lunchtime. Right, did you have a question, Gabe? No, that was it right there. I was going to make that clear. Okay. All right. So he's, he's up there around lunchtime. Look at verse 10. And he became what? Very hungry. And would have eaten, but while they were making it ready... He what? He fell into a trance or fell asleep. Look at verse 11. And saw heaven open and certain vessels descending uh, unto him as it had been a great sheet knitted on the four corners and let down to the earth. Verse 12. Wherein all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls. Boy, Peter must have been real hungry, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you ever see somebody tell you? They said, you know, when you sometimes you have a, you have a, um, uh, 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 you know, you're hungry or something, and you go to sleep, it give you some kind of some, some some dreams. Or sometimes when you overeat and you go to sleep, you have dreams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Either the lack of food or too much food. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, look at verse 13. It says, and there came a voice unto him, and said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. So the voice came to Peter after he sees all these beasts coming down that were kind of laid out on this on this uh, this sheet, this platform. Rise, kill, eat. Verse, verse 14. But Peter said, not so buddy. Lord. Wait a minute. How can, how can you say not so, Lord? Didn't Jesus say, how, how do you call me 
Lord, Lord, and what? Do not what I say. But didn't he just say, not so? Lord. Isn't that like an oxymoron? Mm -hmm. Is that the right phrase? You know, like jumbo shrimp? Yes. Yeah. I had to ask my English major over here. How can you say, not so, Lord? If I'm your, if, if someone's your Lord, you're supposed to do what? What they instruct you to do. If, you're, if they are your Lord. That's why we are only supposed to have how many lords? One. 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 Ezekiel did the same thing to the Lord, though, when he instructed him to make the cake be made out of dung. Right. People yeah. dung. Yeah. Exactly. So he's like, no, God, because I never ate it to the queen. Then God hooked him up and was like, okay, well, you can have cake made out of no. animal dung. Yeah, oh. that's it. As a yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Scrumptious, right? <laughs> so, uh, so Peter... Peter is like, he's like, not so, Lord. But then look at what Peter is doing. See, this is the classic static Christian. This is Peter, because he's telling the Lord no, because he already knows that he's been born again. He knows he's alive. He knows he knows who Jesus is. He understands that Jesus is the Messiah. He understands that. And he's locked into that. And nothing's going to move him. But the reality of it is, you, you, it's not allowing the enemy and the devil to move you. No, we shall not be moved. You know, you sing that song, we shall not, we shall not. Be. No, we don't want to be moved. We ought to be a tree planted by the rivers of water. That's what it tells us in, in, uh, in, in Psalms. All right? So, no, we're not going to be moved by this world or by anything. But we are supposed to do what? Grow. Grow, Grow in grace. And so Peter is the, at a point where he's confusing not being moved by this world with not growing in the Lord. You got to make sure, because the, the devil will try to trick you. If he knows he can't get you to back up, he's going to try to get you to stop growing. I can't get you to go back to what you was, but I can try to stunt your growth. Try to make you a kind of midget Christian. You know, trying to make you deformed and dwarfed. Keep you from moving up to your full stature. So, Peter's hanging in there. And remember this. Peter is not, remember, when Jesus told Peter that he was going to have to uh, uh, die, Peter said, not so, Lord, didn't he? Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. And then what did Jesus tell him? Get thee behind me, who? Satan. Keep that in mind. The person that stunts growth is the devil. And Jesus recognized it and told Peter, you are acting like the devil. All right, because he's trying to stop Jesus from moving to the next level. He came to minister, but then he also came to die. Got to move on to the next stage. If he just came to minister, we could not be saved. He had to do the next level. He had to move on to the next plateau. We have to learn and pray and ask God to help us to be able to do the same thing. All right, so Peter's now at a point where he, God's going to move him to another plateau, but initially he's resisting it. And we'll look at the reason that he gives. He says, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Boy, can you just feel him just, I, I'm, I, you know, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. I'm a good Christian. I'm a good child of the Lord. I don't, I, I've never looked at anybody. I've never said anything wrong. I've never stolen. I've ne you see that, right? Yeah. All right. So this is a lot of times why we need static growth. It kind of gets us out of it because one time, sometimes you get so good at certain things. You know, it's just like, you know, you know it's like that guy, um, Elijah was showing me one time, there was this, this guy, he was a professor in school, and he made how many free throws in a row? It was like, yeah, it was like something like 5,000 free throws in a row. I mean, without missing, straight. But if you put him on the court with Kobe Bryant, I mean, so you can't brag because you can do one thing well. That don't make you a basketball player. It makes you a what? Somebody that can make 5,000 free throws. But if you put him on the court with, you probably put him on the court with Haywood, he'd take him out. You know? Just because the guy can make a free throw don't make him a what? A player. A player. So don't get hung up on just one thing. Just because I've never, that don't make you a good, great, wonderful Christian. Because you can do one thing well. Don't get braggish about that. Understand, yeah, okay, you got a talent in a certain area, but that don't make you a complete Christian. Just like being able to make not 5,000 free throws in a row don't make you an NBA player. 
That's why he's teaching high school or college or whatever. That's why he ain't making the million dollar NBA contract, though he can do that talent because he's not all the way through. Same thing with our Christian walk. Some of us can do certain things very well, but don't think that just makes it. Well, I'm, I'm just wonderful. I'm just great. No. We all got to do what? Grow in grace. Some of us got to learn how to pray more. Some of us got to learn how to get in the Bible more. Some of us got to learn how to love our neighbor more. Some of us got to learn how to do a lot of, we all got something that we got to improve on. All right, and so, like I said, Peter's pointing this out because he's realizing I got I got some things to, to, to learn here. So verse 15, it says, and the voice spake unto him again the second time. See, God's not giving up. He says, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. So he's saying, what God has cleansed, don't you call common. You think you know so much, Peter. And that's, the, that's, that's one of the things that I have to say that in the last couple years, it has awakened me to a lot of things. Because there's a lot of things I thought I understood and know, and I knew this is how it works. This is how it works. But what I don't, what I didn't realize that there was another door that I needed to open to realize that, that the physics that I live in and the world that I live in is not the ultimate reality. God is the ultimate reality. What kind of physics does God live in? <laughs> I can't answer that question. I don't know. So therefore, if I don't know, are there things that I don't know? Got to be. There's a lot of stuff I don't know. So therefore, I have to lean on who? The Lord to give me what is true reality. You see? So it's important for us to be able to do that. So when God cleansed something, it used to be what? Considered unclean. Now, don't you call it common. Right? So we got to make sure we don't live statically to, to a certain degree. All right? and, that, and, and, it, and that's hard to put parameters around. That's why my, my main focus for everybody, my, my biggest encouragement is that you know the Lord for yourself. Because nobody can tell you how you are to serve the Lord. We can all share our experiences and we all can go into this word. But you got to know God for yourself because God's going to tell you who you are. See? And you can't pattern your life after me. You can't pattern your life after Haywood. You can't pattern your life after Gabe. You can't pattern your life, life after Regina. After any, you have to do you, your thing with the Lord. And will there be common things? Yes, it certainly will be. And there should be some common things. Everybody should be studying the scripture. Everybody should be praying. Everybody should be trying to find how they can improve and help in their community and in their neighborhood. But there are some things that God's going to have you intensely focused on more so than somebody else. But how do you get to know that? You get to know that by knowing the Lord. All right? And it may be a variety of things. Your first walk, your first years walking with the Lord, you may be focusing on this. But guess what? Your, your, your you know, next years walking with the Lord, you may be focusing on something different. That's why you got to stay in communication with the Lord. And don't ever think you got it. Or I figured it out. Or I'm there. Or I'm saved. Because if that was the case, just get saved, God would save you and then take you away from here. Because then he'd take you on to heaven. But he obviously has something for you to do. That's why you're still here. All right? Okay. So let's move along. So, now, uh, uh, in verse 16, it says, This was done how many times? Three. Three times. And the vessel was received up again into heaven. Do you think they wanted Peter to understand Peter? I know what it says in the, in the law of Moses. Because Peter's focusing so much on what? What? Scripture says, what, the, what Moses said. But remember, Moses also said that there would be one coming what? After, After me. And when he comes, you're to do what? Follow him. So do you see why it's not breaking the law of Moses when the Lord Jesus says, us, tells us to do something that would seem to be contrary? Because the law of Moses has in it the stipulation that when the Messiah comes, don't follow me. He's going to take care of all the stuff that I wrote about because he's going to do what? Fulfill it. Then you do what? You follow him. Right. So, into a glass exactly. So it's important that we recognize that. 
a lot of people are so intent on going back to the Old Testament and doing all this stuff, I feel sorry because I think that they're putting unneeded burden on themselves and trying to do something that they can never successfully complete. You see, we can successfully take on the righteousness of Christ. That's the only thing we can do perfectly. Anything else that we attempt to do, we are going to do with mis we're gonna we're going to be uh, uh, we're gonna misuse it. We're gonna fail. Thank you. We're not gonna do it right. The only thing that we can do is just say, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. That's the only perfect thing we will ever do on this planet until we go to be with the Lord. All right. Everything else is a series of ups and downs, uh, close shaves, bad misses, and everything else. All right. So, um, in verse 17, it says, Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision uh, should mean, now, see, Peter is still struggling. He is still, he's like, What are they trying? <laughs> What I told you, what I say is clean, Peter. Don't call it unclean. So now after he's been told this three times, Peter's still like doubting in his mind what? What it should mean. What does it mean, the fact that, okay. Now this, what he's trying to do is bring it to a practical sense. Well, what does this mean for me going forward? All right, so he's thinking about it. All right, verse 18. And called and said, uh, whether Simon, which was uh, surnamed Peter, was lodged here. Did I skip something? Yes, I did. Okay, 17. I skipped 17. Okay, 17. Uh, now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision um, should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry at Simon's house and uh, stood before the gate. Now, they were in the area now where Simon was and was standing there before the gate inquiring what? Where is this guy Peter or this guy Simon the Tanner? They're looking to find Peter. Alright? Um, so let's go down to verse 19. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. So he's now saying that there's somebody looking for you, Peter. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them doubting nothing. Look at what the Spirit is trying to get him to do. The Spirit is telling Peter, Peter, you got to stop doubting. Because I know what I just told you threw you for a loop. Mm -hmm. It threw you for a loop. Because you're so used to doing things this way. But Peter, I need you to go down there. See what these men, they're going to deal with you. They're going to talk with you. They're going to share some things with you. And you're going to share some things with them. But I need you going down there doubting nothing. Because who is Peter going to go see? A Roman centurion. Is he going to, to is he going to uh, the house of another uh, another Hebrew, another Jew? No. No. Well, wait a minute. All right. Well, let's get there. Let me get there before we go. In the head is. It says it says in twenty one. Then Peter went down to meet the man which was sent unto, unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom ye seek. What is the cause wherefore ye are come? So he wants to know why ye here. It says, uh, and they said, Cornelius, a centurion, a just man, one that feared the Lord, and a good report among all the nations of the Jews, was warned from God by the holy angel to send for thee unto this house, unto, unto his house, and to hear words from thee. So now they're saying, well, we were sent here to hear words from you. What are you? I mean, you, Peter, you coming to, to want to know what we got to say. We were sitting here to hear something from you. Hmm. So then it says, uh, uh, then called he in, uh, in and lodged uh, them. Now, wait a minute. See, he called them in and he's lodging with them. Whoa, wait a minute. Let's read this again. Let's, well, actually, let's, let's go further down. And on the morrow, Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. They lodged with them and then traveled with them. Uh, let's, 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 let's keep reading then. And on the morrow, after they entered into Caesarea, uh, and Cornelius waited for them, 
and he called together his kinsmen and near friends, verse 25, as, and as Peter was coming into Cornelius, coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet. Now, before we get down to the falling down at the feet, Cor uh, Peter is walking with these non-Jews, he's lodging with them, and then he's going to the house of a person that's a non-Jew. And was staying with the tanner. Now, the tanner is interesting because he was a of Hebrew nationality, but doing a job that made him what? Unclean. But now he's dealing with with with, with Gentiles who just are not clean. Period. Alright? So but let's keep going here. We're gonna we're gonna see this after a while. And 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 um so then it says, and then Cornelius fell down at his feet and did what? Worship him. Now, let's, let's talk a little bit more about Cornelius. Was Cornelius um, uh, a Hebrew? No. He was Roman, Italian. But Cornelius believed in the God that the Hebrew and Jewish people talked about. But what Cornelius did not do, he did not become a proselyte. He did not transform from his Roman identity to become a to take on his take on a Jewish identity, he did not do that, but he did believe in the God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he prayed to him. So he didn't take on the Jewish rituals, but he did believe in the Jewish God. So Cornelius, he didn't have to do all the go through all the festivals. He didn't have to get circumcised, which I'm sure he was, you know. <laughs> He's like, I'm not, I'm not, I don't got to go through all that. But he did pray. And he did do the alms. He took on the nature of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he got it. He understood it. He understood it. Exactly. But at the same time, does Cornelius know about Jesus? No. No. He doesn't. He doesn't know about Jesus. He knows about the God. He knows about God. He know about Jesus. But he doesn't understand about Jesus. And this is why the Lord is sending Peter to tell Cornelius about Jesus. But wait a minute. Before we send Peter to Cornelius' house to talk to Cornelius about Jesus, we got to do something about who? Peter. Because Peter is not going to Cornelius' house. Because Peter knows Cornelius is what? Unclean. Unclean. So you see how all this is, coming, but is blowing up here. God is saying, I'm taking away. You remember when Jesus died, the veil rented from the what? Top to the bottom. That took away all the need for, for the priests and all the, all the, 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 uh, the, the offerings. The whole of it. That's, so that wall of separation was what? Ripped apart. But guess what's going on now? There are still more walls of separation that are being what? Torn apart. Exactly. The Holy Spirit is ripping stuff apart. God is saying, I got to show y'all that you're going to have to do this, but you're going to have to do this together. No, it's not going to be no, it's not going to be a one man show. If you're going to do it, you're going to do it together. It's not going to be no big eyes and little U's. You're going to all do it together. And unfortunately, you look at how we have it a lot of times today, we're not doing it together. We got the big eyes and the little U's and, and you know, the capital I's and the, and the silent U's and all that. <laughs> <laughs> it's all happening like that. All right, but let's look. So now Peter's wondering, okay, now, so I'm, I'm supposed to bring a message? But now, remember, Peter was doubting and wondering and pondering all this stuff in his mind. So look at verse 28. And he said unto them, Ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come unto one of another nation. But God hath shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Who's saying this? Peter. Peter. Did we read 26? Oh, that's right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. No. I know. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying to get get it done. Right. 
<laughs> we do need to deal with, thank you, sir. We do need to deal with 26. Because remember, Cornelius, Cornelius fell down at Peter's feet and did what? Which is why we know that Cornelius, even though he knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he was still a little bit, you know, need, he needed some more instruction, which is why Peter's there. And so when he saw Peter, this man that God talked to him all about, he fell down at Peter's feet to worship him. And Peter said, man, stand up, basically. But let's read it. He says, but Peter took him up saying, stand up, for I myself also am a man. Now, keep this in mind. Peter, he took him and said stand up and, and more than likely did what? Picked him up. Don't be worshiping me. This is such a lesson to people that have a message. Because a lot of times when God gives you a message for people and you know that, that I needed that, the person that brings the message a lot of times gets the inflated what? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then all of a sudden they allow people to start saying all these wonderful things about them and, and then, you know, buying them clothes when, remember, Dorcas or Tabitha, what did, what did she do? She made clothes for the people. All right? So we get it all mixed up. And see, that becomes a form of worship. We cannot worship each other. We can only worship God. I don't care how somebody helps you. You can say thank you and you can be appreciative. But don't, don't worship anybody. Because you know what? They're not perfect. No matter how wonderful or helpful they may have been to you, you cannot worship them. You got to look at Jesus as being your supplier because all that this was done, everything that was done here, was orchestrated by who? Jesus. Exactly. Exactly. God, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, orchestrated the whole thing. So if you want to try to give somebody credit, you can't give anybody credit. You got to give all the glory, all the honor belongs to who? Belongs to God. All right. So now. So now we see that uh, uh, Peter now, he goes down and he tells them in verse 28 that, you know, it's unlawful for any man that is a Jew to keep company. I mean, you can't, I can't even hang out with you. I mean, so, you mean, hanging out with Cornelius, walking with, with, with his servants, coming to his house? What's up with that? He ain't supposed to do it. 29. Therefore, I came unto you without gainsaying as soon as I was sent for and asked, uh, uh, therefore, for what intent ye have sent for me. Now, here's Peter throwing the ball back in his court. Now, in reality, they are, Peter's already kind of got the message that needed to be gained. By him going to Cornelius' house, he now understands the vision. You see that? So now Peter's, Peter's got the, you know, the light went on. And he understands now what it was that he needed to understand by the vision that he got just by him going to see Cornelius and hanging with him and dealing with Simon the Tanner. All that helped break down that stuff that Peter had up as a wall. All right? In verse 30 it says, uh, And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until the fourth hour. And then he goes down. We're not going to go through it again because he's just going to rehearse what we said again, what we saw in the beginning, and how Cornelius uh, uh, heard that the, the Lord said that he heard his prayers and that he's, his arms have come up as a memorial unto the Lord. Um, and that uh, God told him that he should go down to Joppa and go see, go to uh, a person named Peter, who, uh, or, or Simon, who was so, surnamed Peter, and he's lodging with a man named Simon the Tanner. And he goes on, he tells the whole story. And then it, and, um, he says, and immediately, therefore, I sent to, I was sent to thee. All right. And then, you know, he tells them the whole story. So now we get down to where Peter and Cornelius have given their stories. They both were what? talked to and uh, interceded with by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Ghost. Now look at verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive God is no respect of person. For in every nation he that, 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 uh, he that feareth him 
and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now let's stop here for a second. I got a couple minutes. I need to Let me show you something here. G uh, Peter's living in a culture where the Jewish people, the Hebrew folks, are basically completely isolated and separated from what? All other nationalities, all other groups, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go back. Time machine. We're going back. We're going back to Joshua. Remember Joshua came into the land, into the to Canaan land, right? Mm -hmm. What was in Canaan land before he got there? Canaanites. Hittites. 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 Perezites. Yeah, awesome. Hivites. Mm -hmm. Electric lights. There was all kinds of folks in there, right? <laughs> all right. So what was God's commandment to, to them? When you go into this nation, go into this area, and you, you encounter these other nations, don't serve their God. gods. God. Don't take on their ways. And for certain nations, and he gave, him, and gave them instructions, for certain nations, he allowed them to be absorbed. Other nations, he told them to go in and do what? Destroy, Destroy them. Destroy. Kill every man, woman, <laughs> child, cattle, Certain nations, he told them to do that. All right. Now, what was Israel's failure back then, after Joshua, when other leaders came up? What did they fail to do? They failed to keep themselves separate from those nations, didn't they? And what did they do? They would integrate themselves with those nations, and they would begin to worship those nations' gods. And the problem they had in the early part of the, of the Hebrew or Jewish uh, nation was that they did not isolate themselves enough. Now, let's fast forward back up to Peter's time. Those um, religious leaders recognized, here's the problem. They didn't, our forefathers did not isolate themselves. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to isolate ourselves to the nth degree. Now what does that show you? Stupidity. It, they shouldn't chase after other gods, not deal with other nations. They should just focus on Jesus and pray. But what happened? In the beginning, the pendulum was like, we're socializing too much with the nations. Extremes. Extremes, exactly. <laughs> then, when, during the time when Jesus was on the earth, they were socializing with absolutely nobody. When it should have been where? In the middle. You see that? And that's what God now is trying to get Peter to say, Peter, we got to bring this thing. Yeah, yeah, your forefathers merged themselves and took on too many of the ways of the, of the, of the world. Now you taking on, you ain't even socializing with them. You ain't helping nobody. You know, you're not doing anything to help bring it to other folks outside of your own little community. Can we find a what? A middle ground? Can we find a... He's saying find a middle ground would deal with the world. He's just saying, you know, you could, you could deal with these cultures, but you worship the Lord. He, he never says, well... Because it sounds like you're you're waning off the point of dealing with other nations. Now you're, it sounds like you're twisting into well, we can still be in the world, and you can be, but you can't lose your focus. Yeah. Well, the scripture well, says. Be in the world, not of the Exactly. Right. And that's the thing. Don't. You, you can't take yourself out of the world, though. Either. You Are you can't. supposed to love the world, though? No. 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 Okay. Okay. That's what no. I'm saying. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. You're going to show me where it says love the world and everything. No, it doesn't no, say love no. the world. But, but when, I, when, I say, when I say, totally isolate yourself. when I say middle ground, it's like you can't say to yourself, well, because this person don't love Jesus like I love him, I can't sit down and have lunch with him. Right. See, to me, that's, that's, yeah, that's, that's having an issue because you never know. I mean, you have to show yourself as friendly. Give yourself an opportunity to let a person look at the Jesus in you that maybe don't know anything about Jesus. So it's important that we, we find that ability to have a whole heart and focus on loving the Lord, but also being able to love what? The Bush people. people. Well, like Christ says, his first command is love the Lord with all your heart, but then you have to love your brothers too as right. a result of that. The first two commandments, that's where all the law All the law, exactly. Everything stems from that. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your, your mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as, your as yourself. All right. So uh, we're going to finish up here. Uh, let's take a look at what, what, uh, what happens here.
Now, um, I'm going to take a I'm going to take a couple of seconds here, and I'm going to kind of skip down and just kind of paraphrase. What we're going to see here is that Peter comes in and he preaches Christ to Cornelius, and he tells them about he tells them in verse 36, and he says, "And the word of God was sent unto the children of Israel, preaching the peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all." And then he goes on and he talks about Jesus and how um, he was anointed. And how uh, he was uh, uh, working the, the, the works uh, of God that had sent him. And that he was God. And that he was the Messiah. And how he, he uh, was put to death. And how he rose again. And then he showed himself under certain people. Uh, they gave them witnesses of his resurrection. But, he only, but in 41 it says, but not to all the people, but uh, unto the witnesses chosen before of God. So he only showed himself to people that believed in him after his resurrection. He only appeared to those kind of people. And um, so Peter's going on and on and on, giving this, uh, this sermon. And then in verse 43, it says, uh, uh, to him gave all the prophets witness. Who's the him we're talking about here? We're talking about Jesus. The, how many prophets talked about Jesus? All. All. Uh, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sin. That's the end of Peter's sermon. Because guess what interrupts his sermon? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Exactly. And sometimes we need to know, all right, it's time to cut it off. <laughs> you said enough. The Spirit of God is coming in. Look at 44. While Peter yet spake, while Peter yet spake, while Peter yet spake, in other words, he was still what? He was still talking. The Holy Ghost fell upon all them that heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were what? Astonished. Why were they astonished? Into. My, my question is now, was they all like flopping on the floor like bacon and going, what's up, my little bobo? Or were they like, yeah. were they doing that or were they actually speaking in foreign language? You, you know what, man? I, you, I, I, I love, I love... I love this brother because he he don't cut he don't cut no icing or nothing. It's like let's get right to it. And the reality of it is, he, he's right because a lot of the stuff that we see in speaking in tongues, what? I see why they throw y'all out. A lot of a lot of the stuff you see in church, all this you know he 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 ha ha, all that stuff is just trained mimicking. A lot of it is. Um, I gotta start doing it so I, they know I'm holy too. Yeah, it's, I'm talking about my mobile, so I'm on top of it. It's, 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 it's <laughs> but at, this, at, this, at the same time, let me just say this. Let me say this. Those, a lot of folks in there are innocently deceived because they want to know. But they're being tricked. And yeah, we, 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 can, we can look at that, and, and especially when you come to an, a, a point where you're able to look at Scripture for yourself and read it. And we're going we're gonna to close with this. Let me make this point before I decide to say something else and forget the point. <laughs> the, the, the Scripture has been so manipulated by Satan. Initially, before, especially before printing came up, to, to have a to have a whole Bible cost you too much money. So if you was poor and if you had other things to take care of, you couldn't get the Bible. So you couldn't read it. Then they were able to print the Bibles that had them, but they didn't give them out to people. Come to the Sunday service, the priest will read it for you. Okay. Now everybody's got a Bible, but nobody's reading it. You know why? Because we're going from okay, you go to a, a normal service, you go from let's go to here. Now let's go to here. Now let's go to here. You never read the story. You never like, oh, you got warriors in here that know. You don't read the story because you keep flopping from point to point, topical teaching. That's all they do. Mm -hmm. So you still never get a chance to read the whole letter. <coughs> and this is why the Lord, I think now, and now there's a lot of, lot of, lot of people that are sitting down and saying, you know what? We need to read the whole letter, the whole thing. 
Because if we don't read the whole thing, we're going to have a problem. Now, when you read the whole thing, you begin to realize you don't need a whole lot of the stuff that's going on. And a whole lot of it was going on is to reinforce. And every year, they got to preach the same thing. You know, beginning of the first year, you're going to hear all the stuff about, you know, giving first fruits. Oh, yeah. They're going to teach first fruits. Yeah, the and why are they teaching first fruits? Because they want your money. They want your money. But see, that's not how it should be. Uh, there's going to be times when we're going to get through here just by going through the scripture. When we're going to we're going to get to the part where Paul says that you ought to be a cheerful giver, and and, and we already dealt with the parts where Jesus was talking about the the, the, the woman that gave her, her two mice her last. So we do deal with it, but we also deal with the aspect of showing points where, like Cornelius, he gave his money to people, to poor folk. And remember, the Bible says, "He that lendeth, he he that giveth to the poor." Lends to the Lord. You don't hear a lot of people talking about that as well, either. That woman that gave her last two cents to the church, she wasn't trying to say, well, she gave all her money to the church, that's why she's blessed. It's that her spirit, what she gave her last, what she had, everything she had. Well, what, they, what, what Christ was pointing out was you, you, you just gave, you know, Pharisee one, Pharisee two. Y'all just put down, you know, let's just say, you know, you put down $10,000 and you think you just did a lot. Yeah. This woman gave more than you did. You sitting there talking about, I just gave her $10,000 offer. But she gave two mice. She still gave more than you. Yep. That's the point Jesus was trying to point out. Mm -hmm. right? And it's not telling us that we should, and then what they do, they twist it and they say, well, if the woman gave her all, you should give your all. No, that's not what Jesus was pointing out. He was trying to show the Pharisees, no need for you to boast because you gave 10000 and this woman gave two mice or two cents. She gave her $2 was more, worth more in the eyes of God than your ten thousand yep. dollars because you gave because you got a million in the bank. She gave because she has nothing. She needed to take that two dollars and go buy her sandwich or something. But she took everything that she had and gave it. So we're, 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 we're closing with that because we've got to keep in mind um, Peter is now in a new frame of mind. He's talking to Gentiles. He's hanging out with uh, Simon, living with Simon the Tanner and he's understanding that God is continually Breaking down walls of what? Separation. Because this is how the Spirit of God is going to get out to people. Because it's going to go through who? Us. It's going to happen through us. And, and that's what's important. You see, when you, when you are enlightened, when you, are, when you get it, you need to strengthen your brother or your sister. But you can't do that being turned into a monk Isolating yourself up in Mount Ararat somewhere. You can't do that. And you also can't do that by, you know, hanging out in the club, drinking Hennessy, which, you know, so you see what I'm saying? Don't, don't go out here to the extreme. What we got to do? We got to be able to find where God wants us. And he's going to want us to, yes, we got to handle uh, personal purity. We, we also got to be able to be with people. That, that we might look at and say, well, you know what? They don't know Christ like I know us. Don't look at people and ever think that they are not as good or as close to God as I am. That's the biggest mistake we can make. We think that we are more, you know, well, I'm, I'm close to the Lord than, than, than somebody else. Because look at Cornelius. All right? We all need the Lord, and the Lord works through all of us, and we always got to keep that in mind. Yeah, but they got they got some um like church music that it's a it's a club song that they have out that they playing in a, like some I don't know who the guy is that got his song it's like a club song mm. it's like a church song mm. like they have in the clubs and stuff I guess they're trying to reach out to like young kids to get involved with being with um Christ and stuff like that. Because, like, it's a lot of kids that, I mean, were raised from their grandparents. And, like, their grandparents died, and they right back with their moms. Mm -hmm. And their mom out there, like, called in all this and that. And they actually, like, you know, picking up from their mom. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's... One of the things that I try not to do um, is to make rules and regulations. You can't do this, you can't do that. Because the reality of it is, I have, I have no authority to make any rules for anybody. But what I do try to say is, there are certain things that the scripture says. And you got to be able to follow scripture. Um, but I will say this, 
there are times and and when they tried to attack Jesus because this is what happened and we got to finish with this they bring attacks to Jesus because Jesus was walking and did what he picked corn while he was walking and began to eat it and he and he did that on the Sabbath day and so they're saying we know that you're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath day so we got this but then what did Jesus do Jesus went to the Old Testament and said did you not read when, when David was hungry and him and his men went into and ate the what bread? Showbread. The showbread. Are you supposed to eat the showbread? No. No. But because they were in a dire situation and were hungry, what is more important? Keeping the showbread at a certain ceremonial uh, perspective or feeding somebody that's hungry? What's more important? And so that's where Jesus was trying to say, you, if you keep the letter, you will kill. It. But if you understand the spirit, you will give life. There are certain things that supersede. All right? And you always have to keep that in mind. And God will help us to understand. We can't get locked into certain things and well, since it's like this, I'll die before I eat the showbread. No, that ain't trying to, and, and they think they're being holy by doing it. I'm so holy, I won't eat the show bread, I'll die before. No, you need to eat the bread. Check out Galatians 3 and 10. For as many are of the works of the law are under the curse. For as written, the curse is 3 and 10. For as many are as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the Lord and do it. But that no man is justified by the law of the sight of God is evident that just shall live by faith. No, the law is not a faith, but the man that doeth it shall live in this. Clear. It's very clear. Now I'm going to give I'm going to give you some warnings uh, about. Uh, I, I think I need to do this. We are we are moving through Acts. We are about to come into the book of Romans. Has anybody ever really did a study in Romans? If you did a study in Romans, I'm gonna tell you right now. Be okay with this. Romans chapter one through Romans chapter seven. You're probably going to feel like you're not safe. You're going to feel that way. And I want to give you this warning now. But Romans chapter 8 tells us that there is what? There is no, no condemnation, condemnation to them that are what? In Christ Jesus. All right. So I, I might start, when we get to the book of Romans, I might start with the book of Romans by reading that first. Because Paul starts off in Romans, and he's going to hit you. With everything that you're doing, this and this, and what that does is it convinces you. And the purpose of the first seven chapters of Romans is not to make you feel like you're not saved, but it's also to it's to make you know that you cannot be saved by yourself. You have to have Jesus. You cannot perfect yourself. And when we get finished with the book of Rome, with the first seven chapters of Romans, you're going to feel that way. But why am I bringing it up now? I'm bringing it up now because. Just like Peter was locked into certain things. You're going to be locked into certain philosophies and thinkings. And when, you get, when we get to and, and, and we study this, don't lose faith. Know that you're saved. But Paul's going to make you feel like you are dirt. And he does it on purpose. So that you will realize you need Jesus. Before God, your best righteousness, filthy rags. And Paul's going to make you feel like a filthy rag. They, they rub the blood in his eyes before he makes him see, right? So. Yeah, we do need the clothes.